Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War. On this episode of our Spanish Civil War interview series, I was joined by Dr. Ariel Lamb from the University of Connecticut to discuss her book, No Barrier Can Contain It, Cuban Anti-Fascism and the Spanish Civil War, as well as her ongoing research into Cuban anti-fascism in the period surrounding the Civil War. My conversation with Dr. Lamb was fascinating and provided unique insight into events in Cuba before and after the Civil War, and how those events were both related to events in Spain, but also uniquely Cuban. Cuba was in a somewhat unique position, given its colonial past and its continuing connections with Spain and its rich history. We also discussed the somewhat unique role that Cuban volunteers in Spain would play due to their bilingual and international nature. One of the topics that I knew nothing about that we touched on near the end of our interview was the effects that the Civil War had on the political situation within Cuba and how it played a role in altering the course of Cuban history. Hello everyone and welcome to the Spanish Civil War interview series. Today I'm here with Dr. Ariel Lamb, the author of No Barrier Can Contain It, Cuban Anti-Fascism in the Spanish Civil War. Dr. Lamb, how's it going today? It's going great. I'm so happy to be here with you. Excellent. Okay, we'll just uh, jump right in here. Uh, when we discuss the broad group of anti-fascists in Cuba, who exactly are we referring to? Are they communists? Are they, are they anarchists? Are they a mix? That's a great question to start out with. Um, one of the central arguments of my book is that Cuban anti-fascists are diverse. They're diverse in many different ways, including politically. So when I first started this project as a graduate student, I went looking for communists and anarchists because I assumed that those were the people who were going to be involved in the Spanish Civil War. And indeed, I found them and they play an important role in the book. But I also found all sorts of other people um, who did not fit even into a leftist category. We have, for example, a large group of Cuban um, nationalists who were anti-imperialist, they were anti-strongman governance, and some of them were influenced by Marxism, but some of them weren't. Um, and they really, their politics were very much nationally focused as opposed to internationalist. Then we have a lot of people who today would probably be considered moderate liberals who are on board with Cuban anti-fascism. Um, the Freemasons, for example, um, were tended to be moderate liberals and were very vehement anti-fascists in Cuba. Um, one of the main characters in my book is a woman named Tete Casuso, who was a very strident um, Cuban activist, but in her later years, not that much after the, the uh, Spanish Civil War became an ardent anti-communist. So it's not necessarily just the typical people we would expect. Okay, and it sounds like maybe um, it was sort of influenced by Cuba's colonial past as well. Absolutely, that's an astute observation. Um, Cuba had been colonized by Spain, of course, initially, and was a Spanish colony up until the Spanish-American War, uh, which, for those who are not familiar with that conflict, began as the Cuban War of Independence, or wars, I should say. There were multiple Cuban wars of independence in the latter half of the 19th century. So Cuba fought for a long time to free itself of Spain, and that makes its involvement in the Spanish Civil War a little bit complex, right? Because they're fighting essentially for the country that they fought against. And so there is a, a lot of um, sort of theorizing and, and uh, intellectualizing about how um, there is both a new Cuba that the anti-fascists are fighting for as opposed to an old Cuba and a new Spain that they see themselves fighting for as opposed to the old Spain. And in that, in that um, iteration, in that, in that understanding, the old in both cases has to do with the colonial past, right? And then we have what we call in Latin American history, neo-colonialism. That is the imperialism of the United States in Cuba, which also has a, a huge impact on Cuban anti-fascism because Cuban anti-fascists, although they don't necessarily, most of them, see the United States as fascists, uh, they do see anti-fascism as a movement against imperialism, among many other things. So there's, there is a, a, a way in which I have to argue in the book that anti-fascism, even though it starts with the word anti, is in fact for a number of things. 
Uh, it's for freedom from imperialism. It's for freedom from uh, strongman governance. So it's it's a complex um, and and a complex concept for the Cuban that, as you as you so astutely put, it is very influenced by their colonial past and their neo-colonial present. Interesting. And so this time period, so let's say the decade before the start of the Spanish Civil War, is a pretty turbulent period for for Cuban politics. So, so do you think it would be fair to say that uh, a lot of this uh, anti-fascist sentiment and its relations to what's happening in Spain is also just part of a movement to lead to some kind of Cuban revolution or uh, the creation, I guess, as you would say, of a new Cuba? Yeah, so the way that I encapsulate the very many different goals that various Cuban anti-fascists had is this idea of a new Cuba. Um, because many of them used that construction to mean uh, whatever it meant to them, right? So if we talk about this movement, um, the the Cuban anti-fascist movement as being for a revolution, well, that's only partially true, because certainly for some uh, Cuban anti-fascists, they were absolutely revolutionaries, and they absolutely saw a bright new dawn of revolution for, for Cuba. But others, as I've just stated, were moderate liberals that very much did not want a revolution. They wanted uh, reform, maybe radical reform, but reform nonetheless. Um, So I encompass all of that into this concept of a new Cuba with a very careful description of the fact that it meant different things to different people, right? But they have to find some sort of unity in their movement in Cuba and in their movement overseas, right, where they're fighting fascism um, in Spain. Um, they have to come together with some, some solidarity and some unity. And so there's a lot of attempts to build solidarity, to build unity, and the concept of a new Cuba does a lot of that work. Okay. Um, so we're talking about the Spanish Civil War here, but also uh, some of your research has talked about the uh, the invasion of Ethiopia by Italy. So how did people in Cuba or these Cuban anti-fascists sort of react to an invasion of an African nation of Ethiopia by a European fascist state, even though it wasn't uh, Spain? Right. So the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, as your listeners probably know, uh, was in 1935. So it predates the Spanish Civil War. And only certain Cubans concern themselves with Ethiopia. Um, The two groups that I was able to find material on um, were the communists and uh, black Cubans, um, Cubans of African descent. So the communists as as a whole, you know, globally, um, have a sort of party line reaction to the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. They have um, at this point determined that they are anti-fascists and are trying to build anti-fascist consensus. And um, so Ethiopia provides an an example. And so the Cuban communists are essentially following the party line in the sense that they are saying the same things that communists are saying in other countries um, about anti-fascism, about the need to protect Ethiopia. It's not particularly specific to Cuba. Um, they don't they don't make a ton of of specific references to the Cuban situation. It's just kind of the same thing that communists are saying around the world, which I don't mean uh, that in, in to, to disparage the Cuban communists. They were fighting an important fight. Um, but this I say this to to contrast them with the Cubans of African descent, um, who really do a lot of work to try to make. Um, the situation in Ethiopia very specific to the Cuban people at large. Uh, for example, they try to, in their journals, um, in their, their, their publications, to um, draw a historical connection between um, Ethiopia and Cuba. Um, as, as your listeners may know, um, Ethiopia fought off the Italians in the late 19th century, and that was during the same time period that the Cubans were fighting off the Spanish. And so they make this connection of anti-colonialism in the two countries. Um, they draw a, n- a number of other specific um, connections that I detail in my book through various individuals and so forth. Um, so they're really doing the legwork to, to create what we today might call a global South solidarity, right? A solidarity between countries that were under colonial threat um, and 
you know, and to, to celebrate that, those links of, of solidarity. Um, the, the, the Black Cubans are very passionate about this. Um, as I've just mentioned, they, they see it very much in Cuban terms, but they also see it very much in African diasporic terms. Um, so the, the African diaspora in the Americas at, at, you know, at large um, is very concerned with the defense of Ethiopia. They see Ethiopia as a symbolic homeland for the diaspora uh, for a number of historical reasons that I, I won't get into because that's like a whole literature in and of itself. But Ethiopia is very important to many people in the African diaspora, particularly, you know, intellectually involved people. Um, and so there's a, a great uprising um, in African descended populations around uh, the world against the Italian invasion of 1935. Um, so the Cubans are coming at this from a couple of different uh, angles. They're coming at it from the Cuban anti-colonial angle, from the African diasporic angle. And unfortunately, they fail to uh, rouse particular um, uh, adherence to the cause uh, in Cuba generally. And there's one, um, there's one actually a white uh, Cuban anti-fascist named Antonio Pinochet who is a, sort of a firebrand, very uh, outspoken. And he makes what I, what I tend to tell audiences is, is kind of like a Black Lives Matter argument. Of course, that's a modern term for us today, but it really resonates with this comment that he makes, which is that it took Spanish children being endangered for the Cuban people to wake up to the dangers of fascism. When it was African children, they didn't so much care. But when it was Spanish children, then they became involved. And I think that that's a really poignant and important historical point that he was making in anger. I mean, he was tremendous. He was furious with Cubans for ignoring, um, Cubans in general, for ignoring the plight of the Ethiopians. Um, and he makes this comment to say, you know, to basically to point out their hypocrisy, that they were um, only anti-fascist when it was basically their own people, right? People with whom they saw uh, a, a cultural um, uh, connection. And, and this is, of course, an indictment of white Cubans, right? Because the black Cubans are very much involved in, um, in the struggle of Ethiopia. So this, this white anti-fascist is calling out his own people and saying, basically, you know, you didn't think that black lives mattered. Right? Interesting. Uh, um, uh, but you mentioned that obviously the, the reaction within Cuba was different when, when the Spanish Civil War started. And I know there were there were many anti-fascists, which is kind of a broad term to describe the people who went to Cuba uh, to fight for the Republican cause, uh, the anti-fascist cause. Um, did Cubans also make that journey? Um, and, and how did they sort of get there? And how did they choose to 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 go to the fighting? You mean the fighting in Spain? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so. Just over a thousand Cubans volunteer to go to Spain, and that's the largest number of any Latin American country, which is pretty phenomenal given that Cuba is relatively small compared to a number of other Latin American countries, most notably Mexico, which was very much involved in the Spanish Civil War at the official level, but didn't send as many volunteers. So Cuba really stands out as having sent the, the greatest number of volunteers. Um, a few Cubans were already in Spain when the conflict started, and a, a couple of notable ones that I talk about in my book were, um, were fairly high placed in the fighting. They, they rose through the ranks. Um, but most Cubans traveled there during the conflict, um, starting with one of my sort of main characters in the book, Pablo de la Torriente Brau, um, who was the first uh, Cuban that we know of to have crossed the Atlantic to go to, to he went originally as a reporter, but ended up fighting. Um, he goes quite early on um, in the, the late summer of 36 and um, is followed starting, we think around January of 37, we start getting large groups of Cubans um, coming both from Havana and from New York City. Because there were a lot of Cubans that were in exile or who were uh, economic migrants to the United States. And um, so many of them were organized in uh, the Cuban Workers Club of New York City, which was called the Club Cubano Julio Antonio Meya. Uh, for anybody, any um, historians of, of communism out there, you may know the, the term, the name Meya. Um, he was a prominent Cuban communist, one of the founders of the Cuban Communist Party. Um, 
and also involved in Mexican communism. Um, so there's a, a workers club named after him in, in New York City, uh, where many of the Cubans and others organized to go to Spain. Now, the Cuban Communist Party does a lot of the organizing and a lot of the funding. Um, as, of course, we know the, the Communist Party is, is you know, a, a key player in, in, you know, organizing international volunteers in general, um, and that is true of the Cubans. But I think it's one of the things that is important to me to get across in my book and my talks is that it wasn't just communists. Um, I, I've already made the point about diversity, and I just want to reiterate that here, that, um, you know, there were anarchists who were um, organizing to move people across um, the ocean, and there were a lot of sort of fellow travelers who were, who were doing a lot of work to get people over there to fight. Um, it, you know, the communists played a, a vital role, um, but it wasn't just them. And the reason that I emphasize that is that in the Cuban um, literature, the, the, the histories that have been written in Cuba, um, of course, since the revolution, um, there has been a great emphasis on the, on the communist role. And I don't want to dim diminish that role. I just want to add that, that other people were working on these things as well. Um, the majority of the people that went over were combat volunteers, but there were also medical volunteers, including several Cuban doctors. Um, and there were other, other types of volunteers, at least two women who were involved in the uh, children's campaigns. Um, that is the campaigns to, ch uh, to save uh, or protect uh, Spanish children who were orphaned or otherwise displaced in the war. There were Cubans who worked in transport, um, sanitation, things like that. So they really, um, you know, ranged the, the whole gamut of work um, in the Spanish Civil War. And the last point that I'll make on this is that um, it's important to know that Cubans were not just in the international brigades, they were also in the regular Spanish forces, uh, the Republican forces. And this was primarily because of their linguistic and cultural um, affinity with the Spaniards, right? They, they didn't have to learn Spanish like so many of the international brigade volunteers that we're familiar with from the US or from Britain or Ireland, um, Canada, who were sort of famously hopeless at speaking Spanish and understanding Spanish. The Cubans didn't have that problem. In fact, many of them were bilingual. So not only did they speak Spanish perfectly, but they also spoke English, which made them extremely valuable translators. Uh, for the, the many English speaking volunteers. There's a funny anecdote in my book where um, a, a US American ordered like 100 pounds of habon, which means soap. And he thought he was ordering ham, but he, which is hamon, but he ordered habon. And somebody on the other end thought, well, that sounds a little odd. I mean, I know they want to be clean, but come on now, called back. And the, the US American who, who writes this anecdote down said, they put a Cuban on the phone and we ate ham. It, which is essentially, you know, I think is so illustrative of the point that I'm trying to make, which is the Cubans were this incredibly valuable resource for translating because most of the Spaniards didn't speak English. So, and most of the English speakers didn't speak Spanish. So the Cubans are, this, are really positioned to be extremely useful. That is a that that is a really good story, <laughs> a very good story. Um, uh, so so beyond people actually physically going to Spain, were there other efforts to uh, assist in the conflict? I think you mentioned some humanitarian efforts uh, in your book. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the, there's a whole chapter in my book on the Cuban campaign to aid Spanish children, um, which is a. Uh, an ostensibly nonpartisan effort. Uh, they, they keep saying that they're just good Christians and they're, they're humanitarians, they're, charity, they're, they're a charity, they're nonpartisan. Uh, when in fact, when we look at their documents, their, their uh, organizational records and their bulletin, it's very clear that they're pro-Republican. Um, so it's a very interesting case for me um, of basically mobilizing the concept of charity and also mobilizing the concept of childhood and the sacredness and the innocence and purity of childhood to get away with being covert anti-fascists, essentially. Um, and what they succeed at doing is rousing, uh, in their estimates at least, um, over 300,000 Cuban participants in their cause. That is the cause of aiding um, children of the Spanish Republic by um, 
uh, manufacturing uh, tons and tons and tons of clothing um, by sending money, by sending food, by sending school supplies, and indeed by setting up a boarding school called the Casa Escuela Pueblo de Cuba in the Catalan town of Siques, um, which is run by a black Cuban woman as the principal and houses a number of um, of children of the Republic, basically, who fled uh, the, the war-torn territories of the country um, in this idyllic um, setting that flies side by side the flag of the Republic and the flag of Cuba. Um, so it's a really nice illustration of this solidarity. Um, there were also many, many people who never went to Spain, um, like those 300,000 Cubans, most of them never went to Spain, right? They were um, working on the home front for the Spanish cause. Um, and, and folks doing that were not just humanitarian, but also, you know, all of the people organizing to send combat volunteers over. Um, there were doctors who had to um, basically give them a, a clean book of health before they could go over. There were people who had to arrange the proper papers for them to travel. All of those folks did so at great peril to their own employment um, because all of that, all partisan involvement was prohibited um, in Cuba during the, the war. So um, they, there were a lot of people who were um, covert anti-fascists on the island and who really risked quite a bit to take to play that role and to help the Spanish Republic. Uh, it, when you bring that up, it was, were there people who were uh, arrested or anything for their participation or their actions in, in regards to Spain, um, to, you know, trying to go to Spain or, or openly helping? Um, or... The, to my knowledge in the, in the research that I have done, the, the persecution that takes place is um, very much at the level of organizations. So there is uh, a repeated attempt to shut down partisan organizations. And so things like um, meeting sites are ransacked, um, journals are seized, um, that kind of thing. I did not in my research find examples of um, people being physically hindered from from getting to Spain by, by sort of law enforcement. People were absolutely hindered by economic need, by logistical problems, but I didn't find evidence of, of um, you know, people being detained essentially to keep them from going. But I want to, that's an excellent question. And I want to say very clearly here for anyone listening who's interested in this topic, um, maybe there's a future or current graduate student listening who wants to pursue this topic. Um, that's something that could be looked into further. Um, I, because the absence of, of documentation of that in the records that I went through doesn't necessarily mean it didn't happen. Because for example, I didn't examine police records of the period. Um, I don't know that police records of the period exist, but if they do, that, that would be one avenue of further research on this subject. Excellent. Uh, just out of curiosity, like um, in sort of the, the post-Civil War period, in terms of like researching this topic, like were was the contribution of, of Cubans well known uh, sort of outside of Cuba like um did did people understand that hey they have done these things for Spain was it was it a well publicized story i guess i would say um i would i would make an educated guess that it was well known in Spain and that that memory was actually kept alive through the Franco years. Um, and I say that because almost immediately after the process of democratization, which I'm putting in air quotes because of course that is an imperfect ongoing process in Spain, but the, the post Franco years, the years after Franco dies, um, the Cubans are increasingly celebrated in Spain. Um, so Cuban volunteers, who by that point were rather elderly, are brought over uh, to Spain to be feted and paraded. And um, there was an effort at one point to give them veterans pensions, um, which I found some documentation on, but uh, couldn't really conclude what had happened with that. Um, so there, there was definitely a celebration of them in Spain. Um, in terms of understanding of them elsewhere. I mean, 
there is there's one uh, U.S. American, he's actually Italian American, named John Tisa, who is in fact the author of the, the Habon Hamon uh, anecdote that I told you a few minutes ago. He was an Italian American, as I said, um, volunteer, and he just for whatever reason was very good friends with the Cubans um, in the Abraham Lincoln Battalion, which was is famously, you know, the U.S. Battalion of the International Brigades. Um, he was a member of that battalion, as were many Cubans, and he became friendly with them. And he was also a prolific author uh, of the the U.S. involvement in the International Brigades, at least, and in the Spanish Civil War more generally. Um, so his friendship with the Cubans has kept their memory somewhat alive um, as well. And so if you go to, for example, ALBA, the, the um, Abraham Lincoln Brigade archive in New York City, um, the presence of Cubans is fairly robust there. So, you know, for Spanish Civil War nerds, <laughs> um, I think people sort of at least have a sense of the Cubans having been there. Um, but before my book, um, outside of Cuba, where their memory has been kept alive in a very different way as a result of the Cuban Revolution, um, outside of Cuba, there was really only uh, one book um, that is, um, is very much about the, um, the combat volunteers specifically. It's not about Cuban anti-fascism more generally, it's about um, the combat volunteers. And I, I'm terrible with names, um, so I, I, I'm feeling badly that I don't off the top of my head know the name of the author of that book. Um, Denise Ursulay Marganiez um, is the author of that book. I had to look it up quickly. Okay. Um... If you could send me that information, I will put that in the show notes to oh, uh, make sure everybody knows about that. Um, so we talked, we kind of started this conversation with a, a discussion of what Cuban anti-fascists sort of hope to gain from, from the anti-fascist movement in Spain. And obviously it, it doesn't go well uh, during the Spanish Civil War. And so did Cuba's participation cause any shifts in the political situation back in Cuba um, after the, it was over? Yeah, absolutely. So this is what makes this story important in Cuban uh, history, um, as opposed to Spanish history, right? Because we know what happens in Spain, unfortunately, the Republic um, is, is defeated, and Franco reigns for many years. Um, in Cuba, the strongman leader at the time was Fulgencio Batista, who most uh, folks know as the dictator who was overthrown later by the Cuban Revolution in the 1950s, um, but who actually came to power as a revolutionary himself in 1933. Um, this is the Cuban Revolution that maybe you haven't heard of, the one in 1933, that launches Batista's career uh, and is against a, a previous uh, strongman leader. Um, but it, it results in, in 1933 in a, a brief progressive government that Batista then overthrows. And so for the rest of the 1930s, Batista is a strongman leader. And all throughout Cuban anti-fascism, um, his violent uh, control of the country is the umbrella that sort of hangs over everything. And one of the things that I found Cuban anti-fascists did quite frequently was to um, make negative comments about Franco that were very clearly thinly veiled threats or, or uh, insults against Batista, right? So they very much see themselves engaged in an anti-fascist struggle at home. They are fighting against Batista. And then this really interesting thing happens in the late 1930s that Cuban historians have always said, that is historians of Cuba, not necessarily from Cuba themselves, but those, those of us who study Cuba have always said um, that the period of the latter half of the 1930s from about 1935 when Batista overthrows or, or, or breaks a very um, widespread general strike until about 1940 is a defeated lull. Nothing is really happening in Cuban politics during that time. But then this very surprising thing happens, which is begins in 1938 when Batista suddenly allies himself with the Communist Party, which 
shocks a lot of people, angers a lot of people. And then a number of months later in 1940, two things happen. He submits himself to democratic elections, which are free and fair, and which he wins. Um, and he oversees the promulgation of a very progressive constitution, a new constitution for Cuba, which is known as the Constitution of 1940. And in this literature that had purported that 1935 to 1940 was a defeated lull, these developments of the late 1930s and into 1940 have always been seen as, quote, a surprise. Right? This is surprising. And as somebody who considers herself a, a student of activism, a historian of activism, it always struck me as off to say that those things were surprising. How could they possibly be surprising? Those are enormous, enormous developments, right? The three of them, the al allyship with the Communist Party, the democratic election, and the new constitution, which was extremely progressive. How could those things just come out of thin air, right? And so one of the main arguments of my book is in fact that this period was not a defeated lull. This period was, was vibrant with diverse and energetic anti-fascism. And that indeed that anti-fascism is so strong domestically that it starts to push Batista towards, if not a leftist position, because the allyship with the communists was certainly an allyship of convenience, to a large extent, but at least towards a more sort of progressive um, leaning stance than he had prior. Now, I should point out here um, that international influences also played a large role, okay? So Lázaro Cárdenas in Mexico and FDR in the United States were both putting pressure on Batista as well. So anti-fascism in Cuba cannot take full credit for this swing on Batista's part. But I think that the international alone does not fully satisfy um, an, our understanding of what exactly happened. I think a vibrant domestic popular political movement did a lot to push Batista. And a perhaps even more surprising development in 1944 after Cuba has already entered World War II on the side of the Allies alongside the United States in 1941, and anti-fascism has sort of come to full maturity and acceptance on the island. Um, Batista submits to another democratic election, which he loses, and he steps down, which in Latin American history for a strong man leader to submit himself to democratic election, it's one thing to do it when he's pretty sure he's going to win. That's surprising enough. But for him to allow himself to lose an election, and not just that, but to his arch rival in politics, in Cuban politics, is really kind of stunning. And of course, he goes back to being a terrible dictator in the 50s, okay? So it's not a permanent transformation by any means. But by that point, anti-fascism on the island has fizzled, and there is a, a malaise in Cuban poli popular politics in the 1940s, a period that's known um, often as gangsterismo where a kind of political violence takes over the country and really disillusions a lot of idealistic activists. Um, so by that point, you know, the conditions are quite different. But in that, that anti-fascist period from, you know, let's say 35 to 44, um, there, it really has, anti-fascism really has a significant impact on Batista and therefore on Cuban politics. And do you think it's fair to say that the the actions of, of the Cuban anti-fascists in the Spanish Civil War gave them the ability to sort of publicize and unify their movement and to show sort of how strong they really were and how numerous they were? I think that Spain plays such an important role in the 30s because it gives them a way to talk about their activism that gets them around the restrictions, get, that gets them around the oppression, right? Like I said, they can talk about mm -hmm. Franco and really be talking about Batista, but it, you know, the, it, it passes muster because, you know, uh, they, they're pretending, essentially. Um, I have a, a really interesting anecdote about that, too, actually, in the book. Um, a U.S. diplomat had um, uh, an interesting uh, 
episode on the eve of the Cuban Revolution. It, now, so we're talking, you know, late 50s now. Um, he was sitting in a nightclub and it was just before the Cuban Revolution uh, triumphed uh, against Batista. And so everything was very, very tense. And Batista's henchmen were, you know, thought to be all through the club and everybody was really tense. But, you know, some people were very excited because they were anti-Batista. And somebody jumped up and started singing a song from the Spanish Civil War very loudly. And the individual was intoxicated and it was, you know, one of those things. But um, the, the waiters silenced him, of course, immediately because they were concerned about safety. And then they went around telling everybody, oh, he's talking about Franco. He's talking about Franco. He's not talking about Batista. Which, of course, was plausible because it was a song from the Spanish Civil War. So, but it, 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 I think it illustrates so beautifully that even, you know, a couple of decades later, that this connection between Batista and Franco was very much in people's minds. And, of course, Franco was still very relevant at that point because of his long reign in Spain. So it, 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 made, it, it continued, that ability to hide the anti-Batista struggle underneath the anti-Franco struggle um, continued well beyond the Spanish Civil War. So thank you for joining me. And uh, that was an excellent interview. That was a lot of fun. And if you're listening to this and you want to find out more about uh, Dr. Lamb's works, you will find some links uh, in the show notes or on my website. Thanks so much for having me. This was really fun.